two priests on the patio Pull up a chair and watch the show If there's anything you want to know Just ask Two priests on the patio Yeah Hi, my name is Jeff Ward. I am the priest at St. Cuthbert's Anglican Church in Southeast Oakville. I'm Sue Ann Ward. I'm the priest at Grace Church in Waterdown. Welcome back to Two Priests on the Patio. We continue our series on how to use the Bible or what is the purpose of the Bible. And last week we introduced the idea that the Bible is not a rule book. Um, it is actually a book that is intended to help lead us on a quest for wisdom. And we actually talked about how Peter Enns, who wrote a book about this topic, introduced this idea that the Bible is ancient, it's ambiguous, and it's diverse, and it's designed to be that way to help us on that quest. Now, I just said that it's not a rule book, yet if you read the first four books of the Bible, it seems to only focus on rules, which could lead one to believe that that's what it was intended for. And in fact, we have in those books, the introduction of the Ten Commandments, which for some people means that those are the only rules. Or if you're Jewish, you may realize that there are 613 or more laws that want us to follow. And those laws, though, have actually evolved over time. And I'm sure that you have memorized all of them. I have tried and failed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I am not a follower of the Jewish faith. Having to worry about the 613 laws, uh, I am confident that many of our Jewish sisters and brothers also are not concerned with following all 613 laws. Mm -hmm. Since some of them don't still apply, cannot still apply. And by the way, none of them talk about things like texting. So. Yeah. I have trouble remembering actually the, the Ten Commandments, even though we literally have in our kitchen this beautiful framed list of the Ten Commandments along with the Lord's Prayer that came out of my grandmother's old farmhouse from when she was a child. So my memory is not what it used to be. It is possible one of the reasons why I argue that one does not have to memorize these things is because I've never been good at that. So when someone asks me, so what's the fourth commandment? I would often say, I have no idea, hand me a Bible and let's find out together, but yes. Mm, good one. So there are a lot of laws in the Bible. In fact, the first five books of the Bible are referred to as the Torah or the law. And so you have Genesis, which provides some narrative. You get to know the people of Israel. And then really the next four books have an, an awful lot of different laws in them. Laws from Oh, things like how to ordain a priest, to what fabrics you can wear together, to what kinds of things you can eat, how you cook your food, the necessity to wash your hands, what to do to keep yourself clean so that you can be part of the community, what happens if you have a disease and, and uh, aren't able to be part of the community for a period of time. There are a lot of different laws. And some people might think that that means that the Bible has to be a rule book. But we're arguing that, in fact, the Bible is not a rule book. It's not a manual. It's not meant for that. It's meant to help us, all of us, to grow in wisdom and relationship with God over our lifetime. So what if we were to just look at some of the Ten Commandments and focus on how those are both ambiguous and ancient, uh, certainly diverse, but how that is actually part of the genius of them and not a liability. And one of the reasons why there are 613 laws for the Jewish people is because they had to look at those 10 commandments and then start trying to figure out how do they really apply in life? And so they, worked on that. They talked about it, they debated it, they fought about it. Just like we talk about that as Christian people fighting about what we think the Bible is really telling us. That has just been part of the way the Jewish people, you know, read their scriptures and follow their faith. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about something like, you know, um, the Sabbath, for instance, um, how that has been applied over the centuries, over the millennia has had to change. Mm -hmm. 
So we're told that we are not to work on the Sabbath. Then we have to figure out what does that mean? It sounds very straightforward. It sounds like there should be all kinds of clarity about that. And yet what's work? Is work today what work was when the Ten Commandments were handed down on Mount Sinai thousands of years ago. So for example, I use my laptop for a lot of my work. Am I are we allowed to Zoom on the Sabbath? What if we're Zooming for a family gathering and not a church gathering? What do you think? Work, not work? <laughs> the word Sabbath literally means to take a break or take a rest. Um, many people have argued that if you're not doing it for money, for your normal paycheck, then it's not work. Um, others argue that any kind of uh, exertion uh, is work. So then what does that mean? Does that mean I can't even breathe? Um, I think logically what Sue Ann's example would tell us is, is that we should be allowed to Zoom in this case, a family gathering, because it would take us away from our normal work and it would hopefully help us to relax and to uh, be able to have enjoyment in our life. And I believe that that is what was intended by the Sabbath law. And that was that is something the Jewish people will talk about often is that it's the intent of the law more than the actual written word. If we don't believe that, look at the Ten Commandments and tell me if you think that that is an exhaustive list of all things that God would want us to do or not do, or whether you think there's probably at least a few things, if not thousands of things that are missing from that list. So maybe it was never intended to be an exhaustive list. It was intended to give us those seeds of uh, what God is hoping for us to do, to love each other and not violate that love for each other. And then for us to be able to discern what else we think we should and shouldn't be doing. Okay. So another commandment is, thou shalt have no other God before me. <laughs> now it comes down to language. So does that mean you can have gods after God? Um, and which, and how do we describe God so that we even know which God we're talking about? And we know that the ancients, and we see this in scripture, struggled with this idea of what other gods can we embrace or not embrace. And as long as we keep our God, Yahweh, in our scriptures as our primary God, does that mean other gods could follow? In other words, you need a lawyer to try and help you discern the language and break it down. And we can get lost in that. And maybe then we lose sight of what God is really hoping for from us, which is, should we not have God as our primary being that we are loving and caring and respecting along with all of what God has created? Uh, we certainly can't take the name of the Lord our God in vain. I don't even know what that means. I'm not sure what in vain means and I've had many debates about that in my lifetime. So just, just saying the word God, is that taking God's name in vain? Do you have to quote, swear with God in the swearing to be in vain? Um, some people argue that it means that if you have an oath that you give and then you break that oath, if that oath had God in it, that was putting God's name in vain. So Sue Ann, what, what is it? I don't know, what if you don't even call God by the right name? Like what if God, yes. what if God, the word God, G-O-D, isn't actually God's name? I mean, in the Hebrew scriptures, when asked, God's response was, I am. I am what I am. And even those of us, sorry, not us, but those who are Christians who have, you know, translated and written Bibles, they can't even agree. So you'll see some Bibles where it will say, Lord, Adonai, is in sort of capitalized letters, and that describes God. Small caps. Yeah, small caps. Um, and then you've got other Bibles where they don't use that. They use the word God. They say God. So we can't even agree on that because we're really not sure what it means. But again, I think if we think that probably what it means is that we don't use God as a way of hurting others, injuring others, demonstrating a lack of love for others, that maybe that is probably what that in vain means. And the idea is that we should be growing in wisdom 
through these laws, right? The, 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 there's this relationship between wisdom and law. And therefore, when we hear something like, don't take the name, you know, God's name in vain, how does that help us to grow as people, to become wiser, to be more Christ-like? And certainly it's by not misusing something that would be so sacred. We also know that laws have to change over time, like how they're said and how they're used because the world changes and, and life changes. We, we were looking up some funny examples and some weird examples of how laws in our own society are still in place. And we're, we don't even know why they are on the books at all. There's probably some good reason, or at least there's a logical reason someone had to argue this is why that law is in place. But we honestly can't tell you. For instance, if you're in Canada, Ontario, you can't paint your house purple. I have no idea why. Not actually the house, the, the front door and the garage door. Fair enough. But why? I don't know. Wasn't there another law that said that you can't pay with coins? Yes, no, no more than 25 loonies or fi and five quarters can you pay with. No, I don't know. Is that because it's too much of a burden? You'll cause too much of a lineup behind you at the store? You remember stores that we used to go to and pay with cash? I don't know, but those laws are still there. And there might be some reason. I'm fully supportive of the law that says you can't carry a snake around out in public because <laughs> I don't like snakes at all. But I'm but not- The snowman law, the snowman law is crazy. Do you know that you cannot have a snowman more than 30 inches tall in some places in Canada? I am really glad that most police officers have no idea so they'll <laughs> never write a ticket for those poor kids who worked so hard to build a very tall snowman. Our point with all of this, of course, is that laws can be useful and helpful, um, but if they are not helping us to grow in our faith and grow in our love for God and each other, then they're not going to be helpful to us as people of faith. They will only be things that will cause dissension and possibly, you know, hate and other things that would be destructive in our world. So so much more that could be said and so many more laws that could be discussed but the essence of what we're saying is that the laws aren't supposed to be clear they're not supposed to be applied on face value they're supposed to be applied situationally depending on the circumstances that you find yourself in and you have to use your judgment you have to consider what is the best for, for you and everyone else in that circumstance. What would be the most loving thing to do in that circumstance? And we see that Jesus applied laws that way, right? Jesus plucked grains of wheat on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath. He did things that, according to the letter of the law, weren't allowed. But according to the spirit of the law, should have been deeply embraced. And we're going to talk more in this series later about Jesus and the wisdom of Jesus and so on. But when Jesus was asked, you know, what is the what are the laws we should follow? He explained to the lawyer, well, actually the lawyer stated this and Jesus confirmed it. And that was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That was all that Jesus said about the laws. In other words, if that is your framework of how to live and you can follow it, you will be obeying all the laws that God is hoping you will obey. So next week, we are going to look at the image of God in the Bible and how that can help us on our quest for wisdom and growing into the full stature of Christ. So between now and then, maybe you can look in your Bible and think yourself about what how you see God, what image you have of God. But in the meantime, please take care of each other. Please stay safe and God bless you. May God bless you. Amen.